In this video, I will walk you through free response question number four from the 2005 AP Calculus exam, Form B. This problem involves integral defined functions and the second fundamental theorem of calculus. The graph of function f above consists of three line segments. Part A. Let g be the function given by g equals the integral from negative 4 to x of f at t dt. For each of g at negative 1, g prime at negative 1, and g double prime at negative 1, find the value or state that it does not exist. Before we get started, let me mention the common case of the second fundamental theorem of calculus. And it's all about taking the derivative of an integral defined function. For the common case, the lower limit of integration has to be a constant, and the upper limit is simply x. If that's the case, if you want to take the derivative, then it's just going to end up being f of x. Basically, the integral and the derivative cancel each other out, and you're just left with the function. But the placeholder variable gets replaced by the real variable x. Okay? so. If you have an integral defined function, the derivative is just f of x. Let's begin by evaluating g at negative 1. Like any function, if I want to find g at negative 1, I take negative 1 and I plug it in for x. So we have this definite integral. But the definite integral from negative 4 to 1 represents the area between the curve and the x-axis from negative 4 to negative 1. In other words, this integral represents the area of this trapezoid. Here's the formula for the area of a trapezoid. It is 1 half base 1 plus base 2 times the height. The bases of a trapezoid are the parallel sides. So base 1 has a length of 3 units, and base 2 has a length of 2 units. The height of a trapezoid is the distance between the bases. So the height of this trapezoid is 3. So again, the area of this trapezoid will be 1 half base 1 plus base 2 times height. So I'm going to write 1 half base 1 plus base 2. That's 5. So I think I'll just go ahead and put 5 times the height, which is 3. One more thing before we get any further. Area that is below the x-axis is considered to be negative area. Area above the x-axis is positive. So this will be a negative area. 5 times 3 is 15, so this will be negative 15 over 2. That's one down, two more to go. Now let's find g prime at negative 1. But when you take the derivative of an integral defined function, that's where the second fundamental theorem of calculus comes in. And remember, g prime will simply equal f of x. If g prime of x equals f of x, then g prime at negative 1 equals f at negative 1. But we have a graph of f right here. So it should be very easy to find the value of f at negative 1. Let's just go over to negative 1 and look and see where the value of f is. And we see it is right here at negative 2. So g prime at negative 1 equals f at negative 1, which equals negative 2. That's 2 down, 1 to go. Now let's find g double prime at negative 1. The second derivative is just the derivative of the derivative. So if g prime of x equals f of x, then g double prime of x should equal f prime of x. Therefore, g double prime at negative 1 should equal f prime at negative 1. But f prime at negative 1 
is the slope of f at negative 1. So let's take a look at the graph and find out what the slope is at negative 1. Hmm, we see that f has a corner right at negative 1. That means f prime is undefined at negative 1. So g double prime at negative 1 equals f prime at negative 1, which is undefined. g double prime at negative 1 equals f prime at negative 1, which does not exist because f of x is not differentiable at x equals negative 1. Part b, for the function g defined in part a, find the x-coordinate of each point of inflection of the graph of g on the open interval from negative 4 to 3. Explain your reasoning. Let's start by stating that we know a point of inflection occurs where g double prime changes signs. But recall from above that g double prime of x equals f prime of x. So a point of inflection will occur where f prime changes signs. In other words, let's look back at the graph and see where the slope changes signs. This first little segment right here is going uphill. That's a positive slope. Next segment, also uphill, still a positive slope. Aw, shucks, look at that, downhill. Now we have a negative slope. So we have a point of inflection right here at x equals 1, specifically the point 1, 2 because f prime changes from positive to negative. At first I had this for my answer, but this is a little bit wrong. This answer is based on the argument that I've been making. However, your justification has to be based on the graph that you are given. And we are not given a graph of f prime, we are given a graph of f. So instead of saying that we have a point of inflection at x equals 1 because f prime changes signs, we need to say it's because f of x changes from increasing to decreasing. Again, your justification always has to be based on the graph that you're given. In order to fix my answer, of course I need to erase all of this. As I change f prime to f, I also have to change g double prime to g prime. So we would say g of x has a point of inflection at x equals 1 because g prime of x, which equals f of x, changes from increasing to decreasing. Part c. Let h be the function given by h of x equals the integral from x to 3 of f at t dt. Find all values of x in the closed interval from negative 4 to 3, for which h of x is equal to 0. So h of x is the integral from x to 3 of the function shown here. And we want to find what values of x will cause h of x to equal 0. Let's work our way from left to right. Let's play around with it a little bit. What if x was negative 4. So now we have the definite integral from negative 4 to 3 of f of x. This represents the net signed area between the x-axis and the curve from negative 4 to 3. Remember that area below the x-axis is negative area, so these blue regions will be negative areas and areas above the x-axis are positive, like this yellow triangle. We will get a value of 0, a net area of 0, if the negative area and the positive area cancel each other out, if they have equal magnitude but opposite signs. Is that what's happening now? Or is 1 winning? Do we have more negative or more positive? At a glance, you can easily see that Right now, we have more negative area than we have positive area. So we don't have zero right now. So let's move a little bit more to the right along the number line, which will shrink some of this blue area. And let's shrink it down uh, until we get a zero net signed area. 
Look at what happens if we let x be negative 1. If you do a quick 1 half base times height, you see that each of these blue triangles has an area of negative 1. 1 half base times height, in, in other words, 1 half 2 times 2 on the yellow triangle, gives us an area of positive 2. So, positive 2 versus negative 2. These cancel each other out completely for a net signed area of 0. So, h of x equals 0 at x equals negative 1. As I move further to the right, I lose the first blue triangle. So, now the yellow and the blue no longer cancel each other out. The yellow is winning. However, as I move a little bit further to the right, I shave off half of that yellow triangle, and now the positive area is positive 1, while the remaining negative area is negative 1. Once again, these cancel each other out. So we have a net signed area of 0 at x equals positive 1. So that's another value at which h of x equals 0. As I move on to an x value of 2, I have no more positive signed area left. So it seems hopeless that there will be any more values of x that will cause a net area of 0. However, what if we let x equal 3 itself? So now we're talking about the area between the x-axis and the curve from 3 to 3. We didn't even move. It's just a line. So obviously, there is no space between 3 and 3. There is no area here. So this is another interval on which the area is 0. This counts. So we can put x equals 3 as another value of x at which h of x equals 0. Part D. For the function h defined in part C, find all intervals on which h is decreasing. Explain your reasoning. Let's think back on the graphical relationship between f, f prime, and f double prime. And we'll apply this to h, h prime, and h double prime. If we want to know where h is decreasing, that'll be where h prime is negative. So h of x is decreasing where h prime is less than 0. I would really love to apply the second fundamental theorem of calculus to help me figure out what h prime will be. Maybe h prime will just wind up being f of x. So let's be careful. For the common case to fit, we need the integral from a constant to a variable. Is that what we have? So here's what h of x looks like. It's the integral from x to 3 of f at t dt. This is in the wrong order for the second fundamental theorem of calculus. So let's switch this around the other way. If you reverse the limits of integration, you change the sign. So now we have this for h of x. And now that the lower limit is a constant and the upper limit is x, we can use the second fundamental theorem of calculus to find h prime. Given an integral defined function in this form, the derivative will just be f of x. We simply bring down the negative that's in the front, but then the derivative of the integral is f of x. So if we want to know where h prime is less than 0, we need to ask where negative f of x is less than 0. If I want to get f of x by itself without the negative sign, I need to divide both sides of this inequality by negative 1. But remember, if you divide both sides of an inequality by negative 1, it reverses the direction of the inequality. So we end up with f of x is greater than 0. So if we want to know where negative f of x is less than 0, well, that'll be where f of x is greater than 0. But looking at the graph of f, 
we can easily see that this green part of the graph is greater than zero. In other words, f of x is greater than zero between zero and two. In summary, we can say that h of x is decreasing on the interval from zero to two because h prime of x, which equals negative f of x, is less than zero on the interval from zero to two.